Hello, welcome. My name is Sarah and I'm a C3 college student in my third and final year of an advanced diploma certificate specialising in biblical and theological studies. The cultural topic that I am going to share with you today is about women in biblical times and what was considered appropriate for them with regards to contributing to Jesus' ministry. I guess I was captivated by the desire to really know what roles were considered appropriate for women to serve, considering there are some misinterpreted texts and verses in the Bible uh, regarding women's places, behaviours and appearance. And really just diving into the culture of the biblical text and exploring how much Judean culture has really affected the interpretation of the text and its impact on society today. The scripture uh, in the topic yeah, is from... The scripture in the topic is from the book of Luke. Luke was a slave who was a doctor turned disciple of Jesus and a close associate of Paul. Luke wrote the book of Luke and Acts as one in two volumes around 59 to 50, sorry, 75 AD. Uh, the theme of the books is an orderly account that Jesus is not only the Messiah, but the savior of the world. So... Today, the culture I'm going to explore is women, and I just stumbled across this scripture when I was reading the Bible in my own devotional time. I was like, what is this? I was very intrigued. Uh, it's Luke chapter 8, 1 to 3. It says, and I'm going to read from this, sorry, and I'm going to read from the Spirit-filled New King James Version, uh, which is titled, Many Women Minister to Jesus. Um, now it came to pass afterwards that he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing good tidings to the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chuaz, this Herod steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him, for him out of his substance." What I found so interesting about this passage is that it's very eye-opening into what is actually going on around Jesus. It's a small passage that often gets overlooked as it is not a story of faith or healing, but really reveals the life of women's ministry and the way in which they helped provide for Jesus. When I first found this scripture, I was super hopeful that each of these women would have been from a Roman, Greek, and Jewish culture. However, they are all uh, historically Hebrew names, so that's unlikely. Um, and I think it's important to explore these different cultures regardless um, and the women's social lifestyle to gauge a larger understanding of the world during these times. Um, I, will know, I will share on this scripture shortly, but I just want to explore the culture of a day and woman. Um, according to Strong's Concordance, a woman or is of any age, whether virgin or married or a widow. Woman also means wife. So when I performed an intertextual study of the word woman using the Bible Gateway website and looked at every verse which with the word woman in it, what I found was quite interesting. Scriptures reveal that there are two different social standings for women. The first is to be submissive to God and to her husband or father. Uh, they chose to do as they were told and were considered virtuous because of it. The second is the opposite. They go astray and they lead others astray. The Old Testament has a very heavy theme of caution for men to not marry other women, other women of other cultures as they worship other gods and it will turn men's hearts away from God towards wickedness. During these biblical times, people's lifestyles were much harsher and more rudimentary, and Judean women were considered the weaker gender who needed to be taken care of. On the flip side, during a conquest, women were also considered assets or spoils from war, where they would be assimilated into the Judean culture as slaves. I also repeated this intertextual, intertextual study for the word wife, just in, ca just in case, and found that Similar themes of wives being taken care of by their husbands. Prominent men also had multiple wives. Um, and finally, widows are another important theme and how they are to be taken care of by the community when there is no other male member of the family to care for them. 
Another great representation of the ideal Judean women can be found in Proverbs 31. It's an ancient song that a husband would sing to his wife as a way of giving her praise for her virtue. I like to think of it like an uh, industrious woman. Um, but essentially, women had no rights. She was to be taken care of by her father and then her husband once married. Girls were married around the age of 13 years old and had a very limited education, normally just domestic skills. A woman could never own a land or receive an inheritance. Hebrew law made them completely dependent on men for survival in life. Culturally, women were not allowed in the presence of men who were not directly related to them in their own homes, even in their own homes, so as not to come under any scrutiny regarding adultery. Um, when diving into the culture of women of the same period who lived in Rome and Greece, they appear to have had a lot more freedoms. For women, sorry, for Roman women, she could at least read, write, and perform basic math mathematics because these things were considered important for running the household and helping their husband with the family business. Women would marry in their early teens because the life expectancy was low, which is around the early 20s to 30s. Women would have had, would have many children and only a few would survive. As mothers, the women would be instrumental in the education of the children and in the transmission of their culture. Women in Rome had a great deal more freedom than an Athenian woman or a Jewish woman. However, they could not vote or participate in politics and were to some case still exist to some extent still under the guardianship of a male unless they were of the top social class and very wealthy. Athenian women had a little less power in their lives than in a Roman than a Roman woman. They still could not vote or participate in politics or own land. They were also subject to the patriarchal society, which meant that they were taken care of by their closest male family member. However, women could divorce their husbands if they were unhappy in their marriage, which meant the dowry had to be returned to their father. This meant that women were treated better by their spouse, although any children from the marriage would be retained by the father if the marriage ended in divorce. Athenian women had a rudimentary level of education. Instead, they were taught to spin wool, make clothing, run a household and food preparation. The other exception for why women had a little bit more freedom is that they were allowed to serve in religious ceremonies and at places of worship. Um, after looking at the lifestyles of women in biblical times, we sorry would have lived sorry after looking at the lifestyles that women in the biblical times would have lived and the type of patriarchal society that they lived under compared to today's standard of living is quite awful. But to put it, their lifestyle in a little more perspective. Let's not forget that a woman's life outside of the city or outside of marriage looked like. They could have been spoils of conquest. They could have been captured and forced to live as a slave. And according to society, there would have been no one to stand up for these women. Their lives may not have been as relaxed as ours, but it was far from as bad as it could have been. So leading back to the scripture in Luke 3, 1 to 8, sorry, Luke 8, 1 to 3, we see that the woman mentioned by name, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, the wife of Churaz, Herod's steward, and Susanna. Women were very rarely mentioned in, biblical, in the Bible, therefore they must have been of significance. In Judean, in Jesus' ministry, each of these women are in the company of Jesus and follow him and the twelve disciples through every city and village, preaching and bringing glad tidings of the kingdom of God. But who are each of these women? Mary of Magdalene is called this because she is from Magdalene, which is a small coastal town near Galilee. She is Jewish. Mary is mentioned later at the cross, the burial, resurrection, and I think the Pentecost. Uh, Luke chapter 8 is, is early on in Jesus' ministry, and she is already a prominent figure at this point in time. I personally think that as Mary Magdalene is always present at all the significant events, that she has been in Jesus' ministry serving with her time and being present since the very early days of Jesus' ministry. And it is more likely that's the explanation 
rather than um, that she's wealthy. Joanna, the wife of Churas, Herod's steward, um, would have been a woman of significance who was used to a wealthy and comfortable lifestyle. It appears that she left her husband to follow Jesus and provide for him. Susanna is the third lady mentioned. She is not mentioned in the Bible again. However, she must have been someone of significance as she was mentioned by name. Susanna is also a Jewish, a name of Jewish origin. And finally, many other women who were not mentioned by name but were present for this journey. They were all there to serve Jesus in his ministry. These three women would have have each been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. They have had a personal encounter with Jesus and have he and have been healed. Their lives have been transformed so significantly that they choose to go astray, choose to go against social norms, leave their homes and families and provide for Jesus. The act is of great significance to Jesus of the type of sacrifice that each of these women would have made because of their faith. The word ministering used in the scripture when translated from Greek actually means to provide, to minister and to serve. Although Luke hints to the importance of Jesus receiving finances from these women, it is more likely that they served Jesus by providing for him and the disciples physically, financially, and ministering to him during these travels. One other thing I thought was pretty significant about addressing these women by name is in a literary study of the text um, is that each person of the group of people are mentioned in order according to their significance. First, Jesus is mentioned. Second, the 12 disciples. And third, are the three women. And, and Similarly, as a man is tied to a woman after marriage, so is the significance of the three women being tied, being mentioned after the twelve disciples. That a woman's behavior is linked to a man's honor. Likewise, is a man's honor linked to a woman's honor. That the women who were being honored by being mentioned in relation to the twelve disciples, they, that they had actually given up their lives to follow Jesus, just like the disciples, except that it was less culturally appropriate for them. This passage actually reveals that Luke was honoring their sacrifice by mentioning them in relation to them, the 12 disciples. Um, if we dig a little deeper into the cultural significance of Jesus and his disciple, sorry, and his female followers, as we mentioned before, a woman has no power in a patriarchal society. She has no rights, no property, no... Um, no right to vote, and she is essentially the property of her husband. Her husband is to take care of her within a family unit. They were in. They, sorry, they were to concern themselves with uh, running of the home, taking care of the children, and helping with the family business. They were considered good and virtuous wives by accepting their allotment in life and essentially making the most of it, and raising a family with a strong faith in Yahweh. The cultural significance is that each one of these women who chose to follow Jesus in his ministry would have faced public condemnation. They would have given up their kin, their way of life. They would have been left vulnerable to certain social and cultural ways of that time period. They would have lost their identity in a time and place where it was very dangerous to not be chaperoned by a male kin. Although these women would have traveled in a group together, because this would have been less scandalous, the significance is their personal sacrifice of leaving their kin to follow Jesus is actually overlooked because they are women and not men, and therefore not mentioned because it is not part of their culture to mention women. In Mark 10, 29 to 31, Jesus praises anyone who has left their families and chosen to follow him, that all who choose to follow Jesus shall receive more brothers and sisters in the faith than they had before eternal life and be found first in the kingdom of God. The promise that Jesus makes here is that the blessing of following him will be greater than the sacrifice. This promise is extended not just to the disciples, but to all who choose to follow Jesus. This promise may not have been spoken directly to the women of his ministry, but they are entitled to it as well. They gave up their livelihoods, their families and their reputation to follow Jesus. 
Furthermore, in Acts, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit filled all the people, men and women equally, not just men. The Holy Spirit does not segregate, but culture does. When we dive into the cultural context behind this scripture, it is quite significant. Judean culture hides that these women were actually disciples. We hear about the gospel being spread by men because culturally men were able to write and it was socially acceptable to document their progress of spreading the gospel. Just because it is not written in the Bible, that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. These women who served Jesus, excuse me, by following his journey, providing for him financially and providing for his means, they were actually evangelists. I think of all the books written in the New Testament that Luke wrote, Luke and Acts, really understood the equality of men and women um, more so than the other disciples because he was a slave. I think he sheds the greatest light on the female disciples with the least amount of words because he saw their sacrifice and their significance. Culturally, women and slaves are actually classes classed very closely together on the social scale. They had no rights either. E they had no rights either. Therefore, I think that like Luke really honored them by mentioning them in such a positive light. So yes, I think that Judean culture has had a great influence on not only the translation of the text, but on the people who interpreted the text, who are interpreting the text today. The way that Luke writes reveals the significance of the women being present in the ministry of Jesus. He names women because they have had the greatest impact in Jesus' ministry in a culture that dis completely disregarded women. Seeing past the cultural bias of the Bible is important for appropriate interpretation so as to not marginalize women. It's okay that their culture is like this because it's their worldview and that, and that of basically the entire world during this period of time, but that it doesn't continue to oppress the ladies of the 21st century. Looking, from looking into the culture of women's life, rights and responsibility, the extra revelation that I received was that these women really made a huge sacrifice to be part of Jesus' ministry. They would not have left their family. They would, they would not have left their families if they did not have faith that Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus really impacted their lives and his ministry and healing so much so that they gave up everything they had. I honestly was challenged on a personal level that if I was in this situation, would I be able to make the same decision? Would I have left everything that I was that was culturally important to me to follow Jesus. How can women today apply this knowledge of scripture to their own life? I think that women don't have to be so restricted in their ideas of discipleship. The Judean culture of the patriarchal society were where men are the leader are large and has largely dominated our view of women's rights and abilities for the last thousands of years. It has handicapped society and prevented it from transforming into a society that provides equality for all. Instead, this theme has persisted into the early church and continued into the 21st century. An Australian study published in 2009 regarding religion and gender beliefs identified Christianity as one social class that was preventing society from progressing towards equality for both male and females. Is it not time for theologians to look at the entire Bible and put it into a more acceptable, con appropriate context where we can see past the Judean culture bias and not just look at the verses and paragraphs and let them dictate gender roles? I do understand that we must regard the, the Bible as the infallible truth of God, and I do choose to uphold this view. But when God spoke to people during this time, it was regarding them and their culture. I don't think that it is inappropriate to dig deeper into the historical and cultural context of what is going on behind the scenes to find out what was really going on. What is God really trying to communicate? Um, and looking at the Bible in its entirety. Jesus saw these women. He saw their value. He let them follow him. 
they did fulfill the requirement. They gave up a semi-comfortable life. They had wealth. They had given it up. They were actually disciples. So he concludes my little study of the cultural context behind Luke 8, 1 to 3. Thank you.